Okay, I always tell them beforehand I'm a hydroclimatologist, and I do that for one reason alone, is that nobody really knows what it is, and, and so then they feel compelled to ask me. And it's great, and I say basically I, I, I like to study climate, but I'm useful. <laughs> we're, we're looking at hydrology, we're not going to finish with rainfall. We're going to look at things that people care about, flood and drought. So the most famous climate mode probably in the world must be El Nino Sudden Oscillation. It's not actually the best index of it. Now we do have better measures now. But the point is the, we have extremes, El Nino and La Nina. They occur approximately every two to six years. However, this is highly irregular. On the left here we have the uh, rainfall data and uh, on the right here it's runoff. And all this is showing simply is when we look at the runoff gauges, we see in fact that it's completely dominated by uh, a doubling of flows in the river system. And the reason it magnifies from rainfall to runoff is that land surface hydrological processes are what we call non-linear. If you dump one unit of rainfall on a wet catchment, that unit's going to become runoff. If you dump one unit of rainfall on a dry catchment, maybe nothing will run off. Less well known is, is a relatively new index called the Interdecadal Pacific Oscillation. And American researchers have also defined what they call the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. It's essentially the same thing, just with a different name. And importantly, it's a low frequency, a long cycle, and it, it appears related to global epochs of warming and cooling. But the important thing for us in Australia is that it appears to modulate or at least be associated with uh, the impact of individual El Ninos and La Ninas, and perhaps more importantly, the frequency of El Nino events and La Nina events. And the important thing here is we've got both the IPO and PDO, we see marked changes around 1945 and around 1975, and these are perfectly in line with known changes in Australian climate that published well before the IPO existed. This is the A global temperature anomaly series, but if we go to the next, we actually see that we can break that down and we can see there's a very rough breakdown, but we can see periods of cooling, periods of warming, periods of cooling, and then periods of warming again. This rate here is pretty much the same as this right there, CO2 not going up here, CO2, up, CO2 going up here. Now this is just the same as the earlier plots, but this time we're not looking at El Niños, we're looking at how La Nina events that occur in what we call the IPO negative period to all the non-negative La Niños. And again, rainfall and stream flow. We saw in the ENSO stuff that we had a 50 to 100% increase in rainfall in La Niños compared to El Niños. When we separate the La Niños into their different IPO classes, we see that we get an additional increase Again, an additional 50 to 100% increase in rainfall and over 100% in stream flow. So this IPO, this slowly varying um, phenomenon, appears to increase the impact of La Niña's over standard La Niña's. This is an annual maximum flood series. It's the highest flood in any given hydrological year. And what we can clearly see here are periods where we have relatively low flood risk, followed by relatively high flood, flood, uh, flood risk, and then back to low again. Clear evidence that floods are not random. We do not have the same risk every year, but they cluster, and they cluster for a reason. And the reason is there are climate processes that define risk. Uh, I've thrown this one in because there's nothing uh, irritates me more than climate change advocates that say, oh, rainfall's dropped over the last 30 years, it's climate change. Uh, or floods have gone up here, it must be climate change. In fact, trend analysis tells you nothing about process. It just tells you which way they've been going. And so I played a little game here. I said, well, imagine it's 1975. And we have data from 1920 for this. If it was 1975, we would see a statistically significant increase in floods. Climate change advocates would say that was climate change. They have, they do. If we had the data from 45 to 2000, we'd see an equally statistically significant trend in completely the opposite direction. If we use all the data, we actually have no trend whatsoever. <laughs> and the worst thing about this is we've got no trend whatsoever, so the mean is constant, but the mean's wrong. And the reason the mean's wrong 
is we've got two dry areas and one wet. It's not a fair sample. But only got one of these and, and two of them. It's just not fair. <laughs> <laughs> I need to take a bit of an explanation. This is the degree of flood risk. This is, this is bad floods. This is not so bad floods. And this is the um, return interval. This is how often we would expect uh, a flood of a given magnitude. And when we, when we plot the El Nino, the highest floods in the El Nino, is they, they create this flood frequency curve. When we do it with the La Ninos, we get a very, very different uh, curve here. And basically what this says is, if we have 100 El Nino years, the flood risk would be about the same as the flood risk in every two or three years that we had La Nina. So these are very, very different regimes. You do not get floods, widespread floods in El Nino. You must expect them in La Nina. Um, it's worthwhile just plotting the data as a function of just the IPO. And we find the negative curve here, the IPO negative period, the cool period, gives a very high flood risk compared to the non-IPO negative. The solid line here represents what engineers would call the 100-year flood risk. <laughs> the traditional engineering approach to flood risk is if you've got 100 years of data, you treat it purely statistically, as simply as you can. You take your highest flood, and more or less, that's the 100-year flood. This, this line represents the 100-year flood, and if we follow it down on the IPO negative, what it says is every, if we have an IPO negative period, or if we're in an IPO negative period, Every 15 years, on average, we would expect a 100-year flood. 100-year flood every 15 years. Which is why when you look at planet records, you find your floods cluster. Engineers are giving up on the idea that climate risk is static and recognizing that it's variable, whilst at the same time, 30 years ago, if you asked a climatologist if climate was static, they'd have said no. But climate change scientists implicitly assume climate static and anything that's different must be climate change. We've had a complete role reversal. This is Newcastle's water supply system. They define a critical event as when we get to 30%. And what we're going to do here is we're going to look at drought risk, the, the probability of achieving this 30% level uh, under the different climate states. And what we find is IPO negative period where we have these La Nina events has very little risk of hitting 30%. That's because we're getting a lot of La Ninas and a lot of rainfall. In the IPO positive phase, uh, where we don't have La Ninas, which is dominated by El Ninas, we've got a much higher, it's in fact about 20 times higher risk of drought. What causes the multi-decadal variability in sea surface temperatures as represented by the IPO and PDO? Well, there was in fact a range of hypotheses over the last 10 years. The one that I liked right from the start was substats. Um, and in fact, there's been a multitude of, uh, of mechanisms proposed. The one, when I started giving this talk, that I thought was the most outrageous, the solar modulation of cosmic wind. Yeah, that sounds like, I don't know, Captain Kirk with the <laughs> beams or something. But it's like, this was the most preposterous when I, when I actually first gave this talk to engineers probably seven years ago now. But, it's turning out that this one's actually the most favoured. This is a statement from the IPCC Working Group 1. And they said solar variation varies more substantially in the UV region. And studies with climate models, and in fact without climate models, suggest that the inclusion of spectrally resolved solar irradiance and solar-induced ozone changes may improve the realism of model simulations of the impact of solar variability on climate. Yeah. And then, importantly, what that says is the models are actually wrong. <laughs> that's what they're really trying to say. But that was 2001, and I, I don't know what they're saying now. Yeah.